a hard act to follow. Um, I didn't know that's what I'd be talking about. So how do I actually get there? There it is. Is that okay? So the uh, actual process, that John talked about the original meeting for this project, I had a flight from Brisbane and it was delayed. I didn't get there until 1.30 in the afternoon and when I walked in, I thought they hadn't started, but they'd been going all day. So uh, by quarter past two, I had fixed it all up and uh, the project uh, Joe. went away. Uh, Joe. It's on the, it's up there. Oh, there, there. okay. Right. Cool. Uh, so watch that there. There. That's it. Thanks. So actually, how am I travelling for time? I can adjust. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so apologies if it looks like I wrote it last night after a bottle of wine because I, I sort of forgot that six months ago I told John that I'd come and do this talk. To, um, as he entered, as he suggested, so I'm really the numbers man. So what happened was they, had a, they were having a meeting and they said we want to sample fish in the Edwards Wakil. How many sites do we need? And so that's where it started. But just usually what happens most of my questions start like that. And basically I said they didn't have enough budget. They couldn't do what they were going to do. So they decided to uh, just blow the whole budget in the first year. I said, well, you, have, you won't get enough sites if you do it over three years. So they made the choice to go in the first year and sample the shit out of the system, and they did. And it's, a, it's a, one of the single best attributes that any monitoring program can have because they might have been lucky that they were able to get future funding, but it allowed them to get a reasonably good understanding of the spatial variation of the system before they started, and it could really inform the rest of the program and they can modify their sampling accordingly, whereas most long-term monitoring programs go the other way. They start with a really vague data set and then try and improve it later on. So it worked really well in this case, but they were lucky with the funding, and that's because John drives funding pretty well. So just this talk quickly, I'm just going to talk about the system in that first sample, which was in 2010, which was after that millennium drought, and I've restructured it with a, getting my hands on a bit of data in the last day or two to try and make it a little bit more Barma relevant and um, if I've got time I'll talk a little bit about some of the other aspects including what's happened after the large flood events the last couple of years. So the first one is just basically a survey of what fish, we didn't really know it was there in 2009, it wasn't a very well studied system so we're talking about uh, the Edwards uptake here from Barma, uh, basically the system below the Niloquin so Edwards River up the top, interesting Yalakul and Warkul rivers here, and I'll probably come back to that later on if I get a chance, but it's, a, a, what, it's part of the reason I really like the project because, in, because water is delivered to farmers, or environmental water, through these channels, but we can actually have a little bit of say over which water goes down, which channel at which time, which led us to, allow us to do a bit of a pseudo-experiment at various stages with delivering the water. I won't cover that in much detail today. Anyway, that's the system not far from here. The first one, I'm just going to go straight into a whole lot of slides. Basically, it was just going out there, what fish are there, where are they? 30 sites in that first year. Uh, we sampled the channels and some billabongs and wetlands, and we spatially spread it throughout the system and used the standard SRA protocol within each site, which is what Scott mentioned yesterday. That's where the sites are. I'll move on. So the first sample was in um, June and July 2010, just before a large uh, flood event in August. And that's the hydrograph for the system. So it does get water nearly every year. Certainly when there's uh, farming going on, there's water available for irrigators. There is water goes down that Yalakul and Warkul system. So that's the green and blue lines, is that V I was talking about in the middle, middle of the system. And then the, sorry, the green one's collagen, which is a bit, a bit further north, and a branch comes off the Edward a bit further north. So there's always water going down if there's uh, water available for farmers. And now the hydrograph looks similar, but we have the ability to be able to manipulate a little bit with environmental water as well. Just to put a bit of context to the system, and this is the same system as the Barma uh, forest. This is the Sustainable Rivers Audit Fish Survey from 2008 in the system, it's SRA2, which was pretty well at the end of the drought as well. So you see the Central Murray system, I've circled it there, basically it's lucky to score 
very poor. So the fish communities that we're talking about here, using the SRA definition of condition, are basically pretty ordinary. So, and the reason why that is, um, basically there's a lot of native species there that are small and not very, well, they're abundant, but they're small bodied fish. And in the main channel, there's a lot of carp, essentially. And they make up quite a lot of the biomass. I'll go into a little bit more detail in a minute. So in 2005, SRA1, in, this, in the Murray River, basically in this section, about 17% of the biomass were native species and about 20% during 2008. So just a quick overview of the SRA indicators that I'll use in this particular presentation. So there's just a couple of simple ideas of biomass and that is, sorry, nativeness, which is the weight of the fish or the biomass that are native, the abundance that are native, and then the expectedness, which is which species, or basically there's OE species and OP species. OE species is within any particular site, what's the species richness like compared to what the SRA calls reference condition, and the OP species is a species richness or better diversity across the whole system. So across, if you like, all of Barma Forest or across all of um, Edwards Well Cool in this case, how does their species richness look? Don't worry about recruitment, I'm not covering it. So this is the species list for the Central Murray system, or for this particular part of the river. It's really a channel species list, so it does change a little bit if you take into account wetlands, but there's 21 species there that have historical records in this region and that's used to set the, uh, the OP, if you like. So across the region, there should be 21 species collected, or there has been 21 species. Interested to see how that lines up with what Paul comes up with later on. Uh, quickly straight into it, Edwards Wakul in 2010, that first survey. So we've got the top of the forest, the bottom and in the middle. So basically different spatial parts of the landscape. And then we've got uh, wetlands or channels, and you'll see that in 2010, that first survey wasn't going too bad. The OE is the main one. The OP is a little bit um, hard to interpret unless you know how it's calculated, so I won't go into much detail on that. But the OE is saying, so around about 90% of the species within a site that are expected are there in some of the sites. So that first blue line in the lower section in the channel. So that's not saying all 21 species are in a site. That's ridiculous. But within a site, I think, in, in fact, for this particular example, you expect around about seven of those 21 species. So most of the sites have pretty close to seven species within the site. So it doesn't look too bad. Just a quick look at Barmer at the same time. So this was, I've got a feeling this is actually sampled after the flood though. Is that right? Is Scott here? Is he gone? Anyway, at the same time in the river, it's somewhat similar. So within a, any particular site in the river, at, in uh, Barma, you're getting around about 80% of the species that you would expect. So it's probably five or six species of native fish that have historically been recorded in a site. Not too bad. But the other sites don't go so well. The creeks are only 30%, the lakes down below 20%, wetlands 30%. Okay, let's look at the nativeness. So just the percent abundance, which is the red line, you can see they're all fairly high. So everywhere in the system, we're looking at 70 to 80 percent of the fish that are collected are natives and that's just small native fish so carp gudgeons and things like that uh biomass is a different story altogether so the blue bars are biomass and it's usually less than about 50 percent sometimes lower than that so the wetlands were a lot quite a lot lower so even though you get a lot of native individual fish they're pretty small a few big carp and the biomass is skewed the other way Barma Miller at the same time, similar sort of results. Basically no native fish in the lakes in 2010. So, uh, I won't worry about that, just the communities were basically a little bit different between the channels and the wetlands. What we did, we came with a identification of all the different habitats where the fish were living at the end of that survey, at the end of the drought in 2010. And there's a paper out now. So we use that, and this is what John's getting on about before, in a nutshell. We use the information from what we'd gathered, the science, put it all together. We knew which fish were associated with flow regimes. And there was a few habitats that were certainly containing a lot of flow-dependent species, but they weren't flowing. 
there was large bodied predators in certain parts of the system and so on. So I used all that information to come up with a strategy for delivering environmental water and that's published. You can have a look at that if you want to. So how am I going for time now? Five minutes. All right. So that's what we did. We did a proposal, okay. Uh, John, in all his salesmanship, was able to attain some environmental water for us. So we come up with a st strategy of how we deliver it to optimise what fish were available in the system. So of the species that were there, how could we benefit them the most, the native species, to live in the water? So that's the uh, next paper, Fish Responses to Environmental Water Delivery, yay. But in fact, it's now going to be uh, influence of a uh, natural flood event. So we didn't, we did have environmental water, but we didn't get to use it necessarily, or not, certainly not in the way that we wanted to, which was to control when it was delivered in which parts of the forest. So we had a large flood event. So I've got a whole series of slides looking at the flood. I might bring up the Barmer ones, actually. Well, I might go straight past these. Uh, well, there's the Barmer one, it's the same flood. Just to note, for the 2012 data, I had a bit of an issue with the database, so ignore those for the rivers and creeks. But basically, you can see in that large flood through time in Barmer, so the right hand one is the wetlands or the billabongs, so it's quite a lot of native abundance and native high biomass in those billabongs prior to that flood event, and then basically got hammered by the flood, but they might be coming back, certainly abundance-wise, a small native species are coming back. Put a lot more slides, but they all show the same sort of thing. Kundruk does the same. Um, Barmer does the same. Edwards Wakul does the same. I'll skip past that. There's Kundruk. Kundruk's an interesting one because it had no fish prior to that flood event because there was no water, so it was dry. So what we're seeing is the same effect, that is those nativeness scores that SRA is showing are coming back. So every year that we keep sampling, we just sampled again in March this year and it's getting better and better. As it, so it's bouncing back slowly but surely. Just a comparison quickly then across the whole lot. This is the uh, beta diversity or the OP score, so that's the region. So across all of Barmer Forest Lakes, for example, how many of those 21 species are there? It looks okay, but in fact it's really low. It's like 20% of the species that have historically been recorded in Barmer are there up to about 50% in the Edwards Waikul. So relatively speaking, the Edwards Waikul actually performs pretty well, but it's still shy. It's still like less than half the species that should be in the system are there. Uh, the average alpha diversity or, or diversity within a site is very good in the Edwards Waikul as well compared to elsewhere. Uh, I've got a theory as to why that might be if you have a question later on. Um, I'll just go straight to the end one. So native biomass, it's pretty sad state of affairs in 2012, everywhere in the system. Um, abundance is a bit better, but they're all small bodied fish. Now going to channels, so this is the river, so all those ones were billabongs. I'll just go to the last one here, because it's important. So you can see that this, these indicators show quite clearly the effect of the black water. So Edwards Waikul, which wasn't sampled in the first three there, uh, in 2010, so the, the native biomass was around about 50% in the system, in the channels. It's the same as Gunbower, actually. Um, pretty much the same, and same as the channel here. Um, and the black water event after that first watering in 2010 basically wiped out all the large-bodied fish in the channel, the native fish. So there's hardly any native fish there in 2011, but there's a few more this year than last year, or last year than the year before, so they might be coming back. I'll just finish by saying we've got a whole lot of other data that we're collecting. So we've got spawning events. So we've got, we're taking an adult out of fish. We're identifying when and where they're spawning. Um, we've got tags in 200 large-bodied fish, and we're recording responses to flow with that as well. So, for example, these are carps that are tagged in the system. The vertical axis is just receivers that are recording where the carp are. And then this is the data across here. So you can just see that little gap over there where there's only a few lines in, uh, that's sort of like autumn in 2000, and that's when there was hardly any water in the system. All the carp were in three water holes. But when there's been flows going through the system, other than that, the carp go everywhere through the system. And we can do that for every species. I'll just quickly put up one.
video then. So this one is the sort of stuff that we can do. So quickly, remember the Larkul River here, Yabakul here, so we can control to some extent the water that comes down that, those. Occasionally we can. Uh, we've got a whole lot of receivers there that dot through the system, and we've got quite a lot of fish tagged in there. So I'll just run this video quickly. You can have a look with this particular period. Ended last half of 2010, start of 2011. You'll see on the left hand side is the flow there. So the red line is the yellow cool, so it's the top um, channel, and the blue line is the flow in the Wakul, which is the bottom of the two there. So you can see when the flow um, increases that you get a lot of movement straight away. We can do this for all the species, it's quite interesting. So the flow comes, slows down again. So at the moment there, it's flowing in yellow cool, not war cool, but they're trying to go up war cool. We'll see what happens. A little bit of flow there. Should be some movement here. Here we go. So I do, we do have uh, the yellow belly in particular, have, they can come right up the top, they jump in the Edwards and go through Denny and, and up to Barma that way. The cod, well, it depends on the size of flow. They can't get out the top, it necessarily depends on how much flow is there. So there's a large flow, a lot of movement, fairly quick in response. Maybe that'll do. Oh, I think it's finished anyway. Just for the sake of finishing. So, got any questions for John? Feel free to ask. So I just sort of brushed over some of the stuff that we're doing without going into too much detail.